This is one of the most unusual streetscapes you could see in the United States. This is an authentic pre-revolution cityscape. The oldest home that I know is 1663. And what really intrigues me is before the revolution, this was the fourth biggest town in the colonies. Marblehead was major. Four or five thousand people lived here. And at that time, that was huge. And they traded all over the world. They had technology, they had ships um, that were very successful. And they brought back spices from Asia and traded cod and timber. You know, you had to think globally before the revolution in this town. They couldn't have survived if they weren't global because this land is not good farmland, but it's great for, for trading on the ocean. And uh, that's what they did. And they had a sense of the world that a lot of people today in this country don't have. And the technologies they had to invent to do that. I'm very impressed with the fearlessness of the people who built this place and saw the whole world as their environment in which to trade and make money and understand how things work. The irony is our schools don't value that kind of thinking. I mean, I, part of my work with schools is to try to convince schools that we ought to globalize the curriculum, that we ought to have authentic conversations across the curriculum with people around the world over the internet and sadly most schools use the internet only to get information people learn by having conversations and testing each other and trying to figure this out together we are social beings if we could engage kids socially across the web I think we could really tap into that developmentally appropriate need for children especially under the guidance of a thoughtful teacher. But one of the things I think is critical is that kids need to make a contribution. In fact, going back to the days of this town, when you were 10 years old, you went to sea and you were an apprentice, you were working, you did not go to middle school or high school in this town <laughs> in the 1700s. It was, there was no such concept. Well, what we did, I believe, over time, and the irony is technology did this, because we invented all kinds of machinery, we don't need kids working anymore. And so we robbed them of, of their sense of making a contribution to community. I think one of the breakthrough ideas is to change the concept of the learner into someone who becomes a contributor by doing their work, which means we have to redefine the work. That represents a shift of control from the teacher who is at the very center of curriculum and designing the tests and correcting all that to the network of children who are helping one another learn. So the, the toughest part isn't teaching teachers to use technology. You know what, that's pretty easy to do. What I can't do in an afternoon is teach people to be comfortable with shifting control. That takes a long time, for some people years. I'm fascinated by the history of education. And when Hitler became in his first job in government, it was something like culture minister. And one of the first things he did as culture minister is he shut down this school called the Bauhaus. Now the Bauhaus in Germany was the place for artists and sculptors and architects and engineers. It was an interdisciplinary environment. And Paul Clay and Walter Gropius, some of the best ideas of 20th century art and architecture engineering and furniture design came out of this one school because it was interdisciplinary there was this amazing flow of ideas and I think Hitler must have realized that you better shut that one down because that's hard to control and he was already in his control mode 
It just intrigues me that one of the first things he did was to shut down an interdisciplinary school that was the preeminent place for the flow of ideas in Europe. In some ways, I think we need to go back to the Bauhaus. We need to go back to the design of schools where lots of ideas from lots of perspectives are in one place. Yeah, we'll get four lobsters. You have chicken lobsters in there? Yeah. Thank you. One myth is that uh, technology is going to be this great equalizer of society, although I think a lot of people realize that is a myth, that it's not, it's not going to happen yet. Technology is really polarizing society. The next myth is that we're going to have this diversity of opinion. We're going to use the web to get diverse ideas, and they're going to be from around the world, and we're going to have a generally better educated society. What the research is actually showing is that people are going to the web to get their version of the truth, like Fox News or the Huffington Post. The more outlets we have, the more people will only get their version of the truth, and everybody will think they're right. The next myth is that overall technology is just going to make kids smarter, and I think it's a big distraction for a lot of kids. You know, video games and this plagiarism has skyrocketed, where kids are just cutting and pasting, and they want to get things done really quickly. They think technology is a solution for that. So I think overall we've lost critical thinking. We're operating, I believe, under some great ideals. The technology is really going to improve society, but the actual practice is far from that. Which means that we better identify some critical skills in schools that we want kids to really have. Here, let me just take care of these lobsters for a sec. Hang on. Um, So the first thing I would do is identify one student every day who will be the researcher of that classroom, who is on the web. But it's not enough just to be on the web. They have to be taking those web addresses and putting them in the search engine designed for physics, chemistry, and literature. So, so when you leave, you have access to all those resources. So every day, there's an official classroom researcher. The second skill in classrooms, I think, is to be reflective as a learner. You reflect on your learning, you ask questions, you get a body of work, not just individual assignments, but a body of work. And you try to figure out, what have I learned over time, and what do I need to learn next? And because we want to prepare people to be lifelong learners. There's a teacher in Maine who taught me this, a guy named Bob Sprankle. Every week in his second, third grade classroom, Kids create a podcast which reviews what they learned the week before. And there's a team. There's a writer, a producer, an editor, a mixer. And they have a camera and they have an audio recorder. And all week long they collect this raw footage, B-roll, and uh, they put together a podcast at the end of the week that tells the story of what the class learned. And that's in iTunes and all the kids can download that into their iPhone or their iPod. That can go on a DVD, can be at home, on a web. We can also have the collaborative writing team that with Google Docs and other collaborative writing software, lots of people can be writing in the same document, but on, from different machines and across time. So I've seen classrooms. I have this friend in Canada who taught me this. He um, teaches calculus, and every day there's the official scribes, and they make sure they get the notes right. At the end of class, the whole class looks at the notes together to make sure those notes are accurate. So we have the official research team, we have the official curriculum review team, we have the official scribe team in every classroom. In addition to that, I would teach kids really good research skills so they're finding assignments in the subject they're taking 
but from teachers all over the world. So, for example, the other day I was with this great school, and a student had found a book trailer in YouTube. The teacher had never seen a book trailer. A book trailer is the trailer of a movie that hasn't been made yet. And the teacher loved the idea, and the class actually engaged in that kind of design, creating this book trailer of text and an image, text and an image, text and music underneath. So here's an example of students researching the kinds of assignments they'd like to do rather than the teacher coming up with the design of an assignment. So we're going to unleash all kids to be researching assignment design across the web. I want the myths to be wrong. I want to destroy the myths. And when we discover that schools are blocking almost every powerful social tool we've got, can we get out of the constraint of filtering to a level where we still protect kids on pornography but open up this range of social tools that Barack Obama used for president? So when you add these jobs up from global communicator to global researcher to tool builder with the search engine to internal collaborator with Google Docs, this is exactly the kinds of skills that are essential in the workplace. So what we're doing is we're moving from a model of teacher as boss, which is an industrial model that you're told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it, to a model of worker as collaborator, as someone who's self-directed, someone who understands how to do their own research, they don't have to wait to be told to go to staff development. They are lifelong learners. They are empowered. They're constantly adding value. So this model of students having work is in exact alignment with the 21st century workplace.